Five, seven, five, six. So far. But what's really interesting is that they that uh, Hizala has developed. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Lauren McLevy. I am the Romano and Mary Lena Salvatore Fellow at the Rollins Museum of Art. And I will be leading us in the happy hour tour today. Alphon in happy hour tour. Can you all see that? Perfect. And so today I will be taking you through four artworks from the Alfond Collection of Contemporary Art that deal with portraiture. And since we are celebrating Black History Month, I will be showing you four incredible Black artists today who all approach portraiture through different lenses. And a little bit about me. Um, like I said, my name is Lauren McLevy. I am a recent graduate of the, U the University of Central Florida. I was studying studio art. I received my BFA in drawing and my BA in art history just this past fall. So I'm a re recent graduate. It's very exciting. Sorry if I'm tripping over my words a little bit. This is my first tour ever, so I'm a little nervous, but very excited to share these incredible artworks with you today. 
uh, the cocktail, you just watch the video. I do not have that. I didn't have all of the ingredients to make it. It looked really good, but I do have a Guinness. So I'll be enjoying that today. Uh, I am of age, don't worry. And yeah, uh, feel free as I'm speaking with you today to leave questions, comments, experiences in the chat. Um, I will be commenting a little bit on how I'm responding to the artworks as we go. I'm very lucky to come from this dual, you know, place of artist and historian. And so I'm excited to share those thoughts with you. And I hope that I can see your thoughts as well in the chat here if you're on Zoom with me or in the Facebook Live. So if we're all ready, uh, let's begin. So the first artist we'll be looking at today is Charles Gaines. Uh, this artwork is on display currently at the Alphand Inn. And this piece is from his Numbers and Faces Multiracial Ethnic Combination Series 1. This is face number 11, Martina Crouch, Nigerian Igbo tribe slash white from 2020. And who is, who is Charles Gaines? So he was born in Charleston, South Carolina in 1944. He received his BA from the Jersey City State College in New Jersey in 1966, and his MFA from the Rochester Institute of Technology in uh, Rochester, New York in 1967. Currently, he is an educator at the California Institute of the Arts, and he recently in 2021 established the Charles Gaines Fellowship to support Black students in the MFA art program there. So what, what is this piece? What is this? This is actually a continuation of some very early work of his that began in the late 70s, early 80s, so right when he got out of school. Um, but at the beginning, these works were just drawings. This is from his Faces series, just Faces. So he did this body of work, he kind of discontinued it. And then in 2018, in a show at the Paula Cooper Gallery in New York, he revisited the idea instead of with paper and ink, with plexiglass and paint. And he created this series titled Identity Politics, which was also the title of the show. About the show, Charles Gaines said, the idea behind this work is to bring back the basic racist assumptions that underlie the critique of the concept of identity politics into the light of day by arguing through representation that identity politics is an old concept that is part of a larger evolution of ideas that helped establish what it means to be human, what it means to be an individual, hence what it means to have an identity. And if you're kind of like unclear on what identity politics means, because it is very a very vague uh, phrase, uh, just a quick description from the news site Vox. Identity politics generally refers to the discussion of and politicking around issues pertaining to one's identity. The focus typically falls on women, racial minorities, immigrants, LGBTQ people, and religious minorities such as Muslim Americans. So this whole work is about, he's just saying identity politics, although some people might say it is a new thing, it is a new discussion in contemporary politics, really socially it's been around since the days of Aristotle, who is in fact the first in this series. The series is consists of these line work portraits of over 50 philosophers, writers, poets, and other luminaries including Malcolm X, Charles Foucault, Karl Marx, and W.E.B. Du Bois. So the way, I know the, the piece probably looks a little confusing, but essentially what Gaines is doing is layering these faces on top of one another in chronological succession. So the very first, you know, first piece of the show is just Aristotle. And then the next piece, another philosopher is layered over him. So he's creating these layered images on one piece of plexiglass using his grid system that he's known for. This piece uh, that I'm showing you right now is Luce Irigaray. Uh, she is a prominent author in contemporary French feminism and continental philosophy. So again, going back to identity politics, she is a philosopher who speaks on issues of womanhood. She talks about how women 
and a social standing are not starting from the same place as men, how the, how our language sort of talks about women, like language that is used to refer to women, gendered language, that kind of thing. So again, identity politics. For his newer series of the piece that we'll be looking at today, which I think I already said is on display at the Alphon Inns, so you can go check it out if you'd like. Um, this is from his multiracial ethnic series. So for this newer series, which is again working in paint on plexiglass using his grid system, Charles Gaines searched for people who identified as multiracial or multiethnic and invited them to be subjects for these artworks. He stated about the series that mapping the faces over one another, creating this amalgamated you know, portrait becomes an analogy for heredity, genealogy, genetics, et cetera. Each face as it's layered over, so each face has its own designated outline color and interior color. He works very systematically. And in each work, as I said before, they're layered on just one sheet of glass. About the grid system, I think it's interesting to discuss that. I have some up close pictures here where you can really see what's going on, how each of those squares is numbered and how it's laid out. If we think about that Charles Gaines was born in the 40s, he's coming up in the 1960s when conceptual art, modernism, abstract expressionism, they're sort of the styles du jour, they're what's really the thing in art in the mid 20th century. But these styles, especially abstract expressionism, I mean, expression is in the name, they're very much about the gesture, the moment of inspiration and the subjective artist. Like if you think about Jackson Pollock, he very much built up this image of himself as you know, the moment of inspiration. He's sweating it out in his studio, waiting for the light to strike him and him to start doing his, his paintings. But uh, from Gaines himself, he spoke about going to graduate school, which again was in 1967. He said, when I went to graduate school, I realized that the whole activity was dominated by the language of self-expression. I watched my peers in the studio and fancied myself as an anthropologist studying the behavior of artists. There's this notion that it all happens in the present, that it's spontaneous and intuitive. I thought, yeah, I can behave like that. So I would just stare at the canvas until an idea came and made an object that people actually found interesting. But it seemed stupid to me. I could have done anything. So to me, he's saying that, you know, to him, what's the point of trying to force this spontaneous subjective artwork when, you know, he says the eye really responds to his systematized mathematical grid pattern images in the same way. So he's very much not impressed by the idea of the subjective artist. And the grid really isn't uncommon in modern art um, of the mid 20th century. Abstract artists of the same time period, like Agnes Martin, who's one of my favorite uh, modern artists, she also used the grid in her work. She focused on the grid rather than placing an image onto the grid. But uh, to her, the repetitive gestures and systems of squares represented ideas of purity and innocence. I think that the way Charles Gaines is looking at the grid is very much about math and objectivity. And he's directly in his work challenging this idea of the subjective unconscious by going about it so systematically. Oh, and this last picture, I thought this was so cool. When I went to see this in person and I was looking you know, around it to see the glass, I didn't realize that the photo, there is a photo behind it because the paint is very opaque with all these layers and you don't realize there's actually an image behind there, I, I'm assuming of Martina Crouch. So she's still there, even with all this, you know, layered on top, like the person is still there behind the image. The next artist I'll be talking to you guys about is Carrie Mae Weems. And this piece is Untitled Woman with Daughter from her Kitchen Table series. And the Kitchen Table series was a series of work she did from 1989 to 1990. It's considered one of the most significant photographic series of the 20th century. But a little about Weems herself. Uh, she was born in Portland, Oregon in 1953. She received her BFA from the California Institute of the Arts in 1982 and her MFA in 1984 from the University of California, San Diego. 
Weems also enrolled in the folklore graduate program at UC Berkeley and studied there from 1984 to 87. To me especially, I highly encourage all of you to, if anything speaks to you, to look more at that artist's work because all of these artists have such a fascinating breadth of work. But Weems, I think especially this study of folklore can be seen in her photography because it's all so based in narrative. And I think that's fascinating. I already said fascinating, but her work is really so based in that storytelling and you can really tell her studies went right into her art. Carrie Mae Weems was also the first black woman to receive a retrospective exhibition at the Guggenheim in 2014. Should have happened sooner than 2014. So this work is, as I said, part of the Kitchen Table series. And the Kitchen Table series is a series of 20 photographs that center on the life of a woman played by the artist. So this central female figure you see is Carrie Mae Weems. And we see her experience a series of events all set in the same place. The artist's own kitchen table lit by a single pendant light. All 20 photos are in the same space lit in the same way. Under this light, her relationship with a man, her partner plays out. At first, we see the moments of intimacy, continuing into a distancing, a coldness that ends in the man character leaving our protagonist. She grieves, she finds solace in her friends and her family, and she finds strength in herself again by the end of the series. And these are just three selected images from the series. Again, highly recommend you guys go and find these and look at the whole thing because it's such a beautiful narrative, so well put together. Weem states about the Kitchen Table series that she views the series as being for and about women, especially the dynamic between men and women. She shows this power struggle framed on the battlefield of the kitchen table, which you know, symbolizes the domestic sphere that women inhabit. The central character, Weems herself, acts in the roles of lover, wife, mother, friend, breadwinner, and simply her own independent person. Weems' goal was both to respond to the lack of representation of Black women in popular media and also to create a story that is universal to all women. She states of the series that she wanted it to be not simply a voice for African-American women, but a voice more generally for women. Weems also said in 2016, that she thinks the series is important in relationship to Black experience, but it's not about race. I think that most work that's made by Black artists is considered to be about Blackness, unlike work that's made by white artists, which is assumed to be universal at its core. And I think that, I mean, that quote could be like the overarching quote for this whole presentation, because I think it's very important to examine biases, especially in the world of academia and the world of art history, what art we see as universal and what art we see as specific. All four of these artists, although they're all black, they are coming at very different subjects through portraiture. And, you know, anything can be universal, anything can be very specific. Additionally, in terms of portraiture, I think it's interesting to think about, for most of our history, portraits were reserved for the wealthy. They were focused on the wealthy, the powerful, people who could afford to have images painted of them. And photography, with the advent of the photographic process, portraiture could be turned into something intimate, something everyday, something accessible. And so we get to see these far more intimate stories rather than the propaganda from, you know, a 15th century pope. I just, I love portraiture, it's so cool. In addition to these 20 photographic prints of the Kitchen Table series, there are 14 text panels that were written by Weems shortly after the completion of this series to stand alongside the photographs. And the text can stand on its own, it can stand with the photographs, the photographs can each stand on their own. I see them more as sister artworks than the text as just an accompaniment because I think they can stand completely separately. But these screen printed text panels, they flesh out the story we see through the photographs, 
while also acting as a reflection for Weems on her own experiences and her views on the dynamics between men and women. She, uh, she has said about how she wrote, how she ended up writing the text to company men, but she had this long discussion with a close male friend about the dynamics, the power struggles between men and women. And then she went on this very long drive and she says, I always have a, you know, a tape recorder in the car. She went on this very long drive and stream of consciousness just said everything she was thinking. And I saw, you know, one person, one historian kind of compare it to like almost a beat poem. Like it very much has that colloquial, emotionally intense conversational aspect to it that is so interesting. And it really gives a different context to the photographs. And so these three that we see here, this is a triptych. These are three separate photographs from the series, but in the Alphon collection, we have this triptych and they each feature the woman, the protagonist and her daughter. And in the text that accompanies these photographs, while the text still discusses the relationship drama that is playing out between the man and the woman characters, it also includes the protagonists or maybe Weems' reflection on motherhood, on having a child. Weems herself gave birth to her first and only child at just 16 years old. So looking at this, you know, is she writing a, a story or is she telling her own story? You kind of have to think of that for yourself. But the text states, when her kid finally stood and walked, she watched with a distant eye thinking, thank God, I won't have to carry her much longer. Oh yeah, she loved the kid. She was responsible, but took no deep pleasure in motherhood. It caused deflection from her own immediate desires, which pissed her off. Ha, a woman's duty. Ha, a punishment for Eve's sin was more like it. Ha. So you can see kind of what I'm saying about how like conversational that is. It really pulls you in and you can feel her on that long car drive, kind of talking out loud to herself, working through her feelings and her thoughts on this whole subject. And again, the full photographic and text series can be found online. So if you guys are interested, please go check that out, read through it. And again, if you guys want to talk about what you're thinking in the chat, you know, just talk about your own experiences, how you're responding to the works, please feel free. I'd like this to be a discussion. We're talking about a lot of personal stuff today. So if we can get a, a good discussion going, I think that would be incredible. The third artist we're looking at today is Zanele Muholi. Uh, Zanele Muholi is a South African visual activist and photographer. They were born in Umlazi and Durban in South Africa in 1972. Uh, Muholi studied advanced photography at the Market Photo Workshop in Newtown, Johannesburg, and in 2009 received their MFA at Ryerson University in Toronto. For over a decade, Muholi has documented Black, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and intersex people's lives in various townships in South Africa. Responding to the continuing discrimination and violence faced by the LGBTQI community, in 2006, Muholi began their series, Faces and Phases, in which they depict black, lesbian, bi, transgender, and gender non-conforming individuals. So this piece here is Cindy Shabalala Park Down, Johannesburg from 2010. And each of these works is titled with the name of the participant. And this is still an ongoing series. This work is in the Alphon Collection. These two works also from the Faces and Phases series are also in the Alphon Collection which I'm very excited that we have works by Zanelli Moholy because I think they're such an inspirational artist. And I had the pleasure of seeing an exhibition of just their work at a museum, I think the Cummer Museum in North Florida. And really being surrounded by those artworks is, it's incredible. Some of the prints are so big and you're just, especially the way all her photographs, as you'll see, the subject is directly addressing you, which I'll, I'll talk about a little later. Moving on. 
Yes, Moholy states their directive is to rewrite a black queer and trans visual history of South Africa for the world to know of our resistance and existence at the height of hate crimes in South Africa and beyond. Although South Africa is among the few African nations to include same-sex marriage and equal rights for gender non-conforming people in its constitution, there still exists hatred and violence against these same people. And with their work, Moholy seeks to both explore these contradictions toward LGBTQI people in South Africa, as well as provide representation for them. Moholy has said of their work that you can't change the laws without changing the images. And I think part of that is Moholy creates these mobile studios to photograph their participants, which again, they specifically address or when they're talking about the people that they photograph, they specifically address them as participants rather than subjects because they believe that, you know, subject erases that human connection that photography has, especially portrait photography. So when they photograph their participants, um, they, I mean, they'll photograph them anywhere. They have the mobile studio. And to me, that is part of they're creating a representation because they are literally taking up space that they're told, you know, that LGBTQI people in South Africa cannot have, or that they may be afraid to inhabit that space because of violence. So they're literally taking up this space and creating this representation. And as they, you know, say about their mobile studio, they say, we live here, pay taxes, we are citizens of this country, which they say is democratic. Any space is a possible space. Muholi also includes former participants in Faces and Phases in their photographic projects with the purpose to empower them and involve them in their own narrative, continuing forward from just being a participant. So they're in front of the camera and then they invite participants to be behind the camera. It's very cool. There is an Art21 video you can find online for free. Art21 is a series from PBS where uh, artists are interviewed and there's a segment where Zanelle Moholy is taking these photos and talking about their mobile studio. It's very interesting. I, additionally, if you're interested, there is this really beautiful video from the Tate Modern YouTube channel. It's just called Tate Modern. And the video is titled From a Place of Love, Zanelle Moholy, Tate Exchange, and in the video, trans, intersex, and queer identifying people of color speak on their reactions to Moholy's work. As Tate had an exhibition of their work, their entire body of work, over 200 photographs in the past couple of years. And so the people in the video are talking about their reaction to the work and their own experiences being people of color and members of the LGBTQIA community in the UK and the intersection of those identities. Other works from Zanelli Moholy include their Brave Beauty series, which is from 2014 to the present day. Uh, they look specifically at South African trans women who are beauty queens or former beauty queens. I think if you are interested in looking at fashion photography, definitely check out this series. The photos are very like Vogue. I think Moholy has such a great understanding of shape and light and dark, and they create these very striking images. And it's just beautiful photography. Their most recent series is titled Somniyama Ingonyama, and that translates to Hail the Dark Lioness in Zulu, which is Moholy's native language. And all of the works in Somniyama and Gonyama are self-portraits. So each self-portrait features an alter ego of Moholi, and each one is titled with a name, like a Zulu name. Each self-portrait also represents a specific experience that the artist has had, and so is a way for them to show and also work through those experiences. And also all three of these works are additionally in the Alphon collection. Moholy said about this series in an interview with Tate Modern that they had spent so long focused on documenting others documenting their experiences and pain that they had neglected dealing with their own pain. And Somniyama Ingonyama deals with themes of gender, beauty standards, race, the Western gaze, and more.
generally using symbolic props, which I think you can see in these images. And from Harvard's Cooper Gallery website, because I think this person said it the best that I saw, better than I could, they said, scouring pads and latex gloves address themes of domestic servitude while alluding to sexual politics, cultural violence, and the often suffocating prisms of gendered identities. Rubber tires, cable ties, or electrical cords invoke forms of social brutality and exploitation. Sheets of plastic and polythene draw attention to environmental issues and global waste, while accessories like cowrie shells and beaded fly whisks highlight Western fascinations with cliched, exoticized representations of African culture. Incredible series. And I see there's something in the chat. Oh, Enna Heller, um, a curator at our museum at Rollins stated, it's interesting to think about the connection between story and portrait here. Do you see the entire series as one portrait defined by the story or as a series of portrait in reference to the kitchen table series? That is a great question. <laughs> I do, Weems has said about the, the series that each one can stand on its own. And I think that's true. I see it as a series of portraits because I think each one, especially divorced from the text accompaniment, let me bring us back to the kitchen table series. I think each one really tells its own story. You can derive so much meaning. Each photograph is so psychologically charged. And I think that speaks to Carrie Mae Weems' talent and power as a photographer, as an artist. Again, her use of you know, shapes, lighting contributes so much to that. For instance, in this piece on the left, you know, we show Weems reading, her daughter is standing in the background a little in the shadow. Earlier in the series, there's the same scene, but it's the man character. He's at the table reading and, you know, Weems is standing in the background in shadow. And depending on what experience you're drawing from, you can take so many things from that. To me, it's, you know, she felt neglected, and now her daughter is feeling that same neglect. Is that neglect our birthright as women? Like, are we meant to fade into the background? Is she accidentally enacting that on her daughter because now she has to be the breadwinner of the household? Is it that when women become the sole provider, do we feel like we have to take on a man's role? There's so many different things you could take from it depending on your own experience. And I think that's something that makes the series so iconic and powerful. And Anna also said, let me see if I can scroll down here. What stood out from the comments of visitors to the Tate exhibition of Moholy's work from the Tate video? It was interesting. The video is so good, I think, because it even moves away so much from discussing the work which one common thing that people in the video really said about the work is how important representation is. And I think Moholy, you know, very intimately knows that. And that's why they create these series. And that's why I think visual activist is a very accurate descriptor for them. My mouth is going dry. Uh, so a lot, of, a lot of what was said was about how important representation is. And I think that's still true. But you know, everyone moved on from that to discussing their own experiences and especially about intersection of different identities. So for instance, there was an older black gay woman and she talked about going to gay bars in London in the nineties and in certain places. And it was like, no one there was black. It was all, you know, white people and how that's changed, how it's kind of still the same. And I think discussing that intersection of identities is very important. Uh, Carrie Mae Weems also discussed that when talking about her work. It's just very powerful to see people talk about their stories. And I think one of the reasons art is so important is because it really causes people to connect emotionally to something. 
and it brings out those stories and it brings it out in maybe a different context than they would have thought of before. Which is just me talking about how much I love art and you know how excited I am to be doing this. But again, I highly recommend that video. I will say the name again. It is on the Tate Modern YouTube channel and it is called From a Place of Love, Zanelli Moholy, Tate Exchange. Our final artist today, our final work of art is from Hank Willis Thomas and is titled Freedom Writers Spectrum. And this is like our first work currently on display at the Alphand Inn. And this is another one that I really think you have to see in person. You have to go to fully appreciate this one and I will explain why. A little bit about Hank Willis Thomas first. He was born in 1976 in Plainsfield, New Jersey. In 1998, he received a BFA from New York University. In 2004, an MFA from California College of the Arts. And he lives and works currently in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, much of his work, which is very multidisciplinary, Thomas works in photography, sculpture, installation. You know, he, he doesn't just wear one hat. He does a lot of, a lot of different things. But all of his work addresses the intersection between race, social politics, and representation. So this piece, Freedom Rider Spectrum, is a continuation of the work from his first solo show, which was titled An All-Colored Cast, which took archival film images and still images from mid-century films. Um, and these were images of African-American people and other people of color and actors. And he printed them on this colorful retroflective vinyl to create these seemingly abstract rainbow rectangles. And you know, you, when you stand at certain angles, the faces are revealed. Or when you flash, you know, the flash from a camera or from your phone, that light brings out the faces. This material is, think of when you're driving at night and your headlights catch a sign, like a men at work sign or a yield sign and it just flashes back in your face. That's kind of what the retroflective vinyl is. It's used in signage. The format of the colorful rectangle, he's recalling, you know, color field paintings, which again is something from abstract art of the mid-century, same time frame he's taking these images from. But it also recalls color calibration bars used for color correction in photographs. And as it says in the press release for this exhibition, it talks about how Thomas is using color theory and screen color calibration charts as an aesthetic starting point. He's re-examining the language surrounding color correction and white balance in order to demonstrate the charged language of color, particularly around the time of desegregation and the proliferation of technicolor in America. So very conscious choice. It's not just a rainbow rectangle. He's very specifically drawing on this sort of imagery. Which brings us to the work we're looking at, which is Freedom Writers Spectrum. And in this work, you can see kind of what it would the work looks like as you just walk up to it and then illuminate it. So the faces in this artwork are members of the original Freedom Writers, which were a group of over 400 black and white activists that participated in the Freedom Rides through the Deep South organized by the Congress of Racial Equality, or CORE, in 1961. And the 1961 Freedom Rides were modeled on the 1947 Journey of Reconciliation, also organized by CORE. In 1947, uh, black and white bus riders tested a US Supreme Court decision that found segregated bus seating was unconstitutional. Similarly, the 1961 Freedom Rides sought to test a 1960 decision by the Supreme Court that segregation of interstate transportation facilities, including bus terminals, was also unconstitutional. So they were just, you know, riding the bus. The Supreme Court ruled that it was unconstitutional to segregate, but they, they faced so much violence and backlash. Such were the times. Also, I think it's interesting to note a big difference between the journey of reconciliation in the 40s and the freedom rides in the 60s was that the freedom rides included women. They were allowed to join. 
The names of all of these activists that are depicted here are still being identified, but they include uh, students Catherine Burks, third from the left, excuse me, Rita Carter on the far right, uh, Stokely Carmichael, second from the right, and core member John Luther Dolan at the center in dark blue. Reverend Grant Harland Muse Jr. is fourth from the right, and civil rights leader John Lewis is at the far left, and he was one of the 13 original Freedom Riders arrested in Jackson, Mississippi in May 1961. So I'll show you a few pictures that I took when I visited this piece at the Alphand Inn to illustrate that the faces are only visible without a phone light, which I didn't realize when I went. So to me at the time, the faces were only visible by moving back and forth, by looking at the piece from different angles. And that creates this interaction with the artwork. Even you know, taking your phone and illuminating it, it creates this interaction. And the act of illuminating here, it functions both literally and metaphorically because the light is revealing the photographs and the light is revealing this overlooked story from history. Hank Willis Thomas also has other works that are interactive in this way. He has a work titled Powerfulness uh, from 2009, and that is a holographic rectangle. And from one angle, it reads powerless, and from another, it reads powerful. And he states about that work, which I definitely think applies here too, that he, Thomas said he enjoys creating works where the only way to truly understand the meaning is to move around it, changing your own relationship to the work, because that's how history is. You have to look at historical events from multiple angles to see the whole picture. And again, he is literally bringing the story to light. And I think something that is very interesting about these artists is we have two artists, all are dealing in portraiture. We have two artists that are creating this much more interactive and intimate experience with the artwork, and then two that are very removed. I feel like Charles Gaines, because he creates this purposely objective process for creating his works, he is more removed from what he's talking about. He's looking at issues of hereditary social issues surrounding you know, race and ethnicity from a more macro perspective. And then you have Zanali Moholi, who has the people that she photographs, they are staring right at you. They are staring into your soul. You are being addressed by the artwork. And even Carrie Mae Weems, so the subject is intimate. If you look at, I'll bring you guys back. If you look at the pictures, you are not seated at the table. You are not invited to participate. You are viewing the story at eye level. You are not a part. So I think, it's very, just very interesting. Art can be so many different things, more interactive, more objective, even when dealing something with something as personal as the representation of the human form via portraiture. And Hank Willis Thomas was our last artist today. And so that's my presentation. And I see we have another question in the chat. It is, it is so much, you so much better in person, spectrum. Like you have to go see it because I don't think those pictures can do it justice. And Alexia says, as an artist yourself, which of these works or artists did you resonate with most conceptually and or in practice? That's a great question. I think the artist who most resonated me, what, resonated with me, which I'd also be really interested for you guys to send in the chat if you would, who most resonated with you and why. Because again, that's something that is one of the best things about art is everyone can respond to it so differently. But as an artist, as someone who works in portraiture, I think Zanelle Muholi is my favorite because their work is just so direct and it's so focused on the audience member looking in conversation, a silent conversation with the subject. 
And I also think that their work of creating representation for LGBTQI people, especially in a place where they can be killed. I mean, for these, this series, for Faces and Phases, they say, you know, for this, the participants' own protection, uh, Muholi will only photograph people who are, you know, of age and publicly out with, you know, their identity because they can be killed. And I think it's something that we forget is that even in our own country, which we perceive as safer than an African country, people can people are still killed, you know, every week, all the time for being who they are. And this representation, especially at the intersection of, you know, race and sexuality and gender, seeing Black LGBTQI people is so important for anyone worldwide. So I think I definitely, this series, this artist speaks to me the most. And again, I think that their use of light and shape is so beautiful. Like I love the soft light, you know, especially in this one, how this black dress creates this swinging movement of your eye, you know, throughout the piece, I think is so lovely. Uh, great series again, check it out. And there are more questions. Will there be any opportunities to see the complete kitchen table series together anywhere? I'm not sure if there are any museums or institutions that have the entire series. We have, or the Alphon collection has three uh, photographic prints from the series, but I'm not sure if anyone but the artist herself and the gallery, her uh, gallery that represents her, has the entire series in one place. Or I could be wrong. I think maybe the Brooklyn Museum has the entire series. I don't know if it's on view right now, but I think the Brooklyn Museum might have all 20 photographs. Not sure about the 14 text accompaniments though. And kitchen table series resonated most powerfully with me as a woman who often functioned as a single mother during military deployments. I could feel the emotions very poignantly. Yeah. Again, you know, everyone will take something different. I am not yet a mother, but, you know, I have a significant other. I am a daughter. I am a woman. Anyone, everyone, everyone can get different things from this series and really any of the work that I showed here today. Thank you, Charles and Perry Fogel, I appreciate that. And from Barbara Alfond, maybe you just know that much of the income that Mahole derives from the sale of her art goes to support members of the LGBTQIA community. I didn't know that, that's wonderful. I think that kind of ties into how they include participants from the Faces and Phases series in you know, the behind the scenes of their later shoots. I think another thing I really like about Zanelli Moholi is they're so dedicated to putting everything back into their community, to uplifting members of their community in South Africa. And that, you know, putting their income back into their work, into back into their community, it's just another part of that. And I think that's incredible. So thank you very much for sharing that. That's great to know. Thank you, Kathleen. So any other questions? Anyone just want to discuss something? Definitely. Like I said, visual activist, I saw, I saw uh, Moholi described as that somewhere and it just applies so completely. So important. I think uh, Hank Willis Thomas too is very much a visual activist. If you look at his other work, other than the Spectrum series, which is very new, very new, I couldn't really find anything about it online, which is part of why I went to see it in person and discovered that it's so, so important to see it in person. Uh, yeah, Thomas too is very much an artist activist, very involved in discussing uh, issues of race, subjects relating to the Black community. Very compelling work. Every, all, all the artists tonight, very compelling. 
And also thank you for your comments. And yeah, questions. If you wanna, you can probably unmute yourself and ask a question directly and we can have a discussion if anyone wants to. Anyone on Facebook Live wants to send in a question or a comment, topic, very open to talking about any of this. What is everyone drinking? Because I'm having the Guinness. So I'm wondering if everyone else has the cocktail or if we're drinking other things. Cocktail looked really good. <laughs> Water, yeah, makes sense. Thank you, thank you, Barbara. I very much look forward to meeting you as well. Scotch, I've never had scotch. I hope it's good. I don't know what makes good scotch. Do you put ice in scotch or no? Is that one of the ones you don't ice? It's turned into a discussion about alcohol. <laughs> Lots of water is good, you gotta stay hydrated. I'm regretting the decision to not have water. This is probably more than I've ever spoken in my life at one time. I suppose if there aren't any questions, comments. Comments from Facebook. All right, uh, if anyone has any last minute things to say, if not, I think we can uh, head out. Thank you all so much for coming to this. I'm so glad that I got to share this information with all of you today. Uh, I was so exciting and incredible. I know I say those words a lot, but it was so exciting, and incredible to be able to put this presentation together. These are four artists that I think I am better for knowing more about them, all making amazing work from all different perspectives. And again, thank you. You can RSVP to the next Alphon tour. I think our lovely social media coordinator, Lainey Velasquez, put a message at the top of the chat, first message about RSVPing. Uh, I'm not sure what the subject of the next one is, but it is by uh, the other fellow, the Hicks fellow at our museum, Maya, and she's amazing. So I'm sure the talk will be amazing. Women's History Month, how could I forget? Definitely tune in for that. That will be so great. And yeah, thank you all for coming. I hope you're enjoying your drinks, whether it's water or scotch and have a wonderful night. Thank you and goodbye.